Gleiserwitz is the director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and a senior research scientist at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. He is an expert on public opinion and engagement with the issues of climate change and the environment. His research investigates the psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence environmental beliefs, attitudes, policy support, and behavior. He, he conducts research at the global, national, and local scales, including studies in the United States, China, and India. He has also conducted the first study of worldwide public values, attitudes, and behaviors regarding sustainability, including environmental protection, economic prosperity, and human development. And frankly, there isn't a person or organization that we work more, more closely with, and we're so thrilled that Anthony Leiserwitz is here this morning. Thank you so much, Mark, and wow, what a crowd. I love it. So thank you so much to Mark for the invitation to be here today. It's really an honor, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege. Uh, but even more importantly, I want to say thank you to all of you. I've been a major supporter of CCL since its very, very founding, because what it did is something that no other group had really done. Is in its DNA, it put as its goal to shift the political climate of climate change from the grassroots, from the bottom up, not just within Washington, D.C. And so, in fact, I'll just say that as a broader goal, I really think this idea of shifting the political climate is absolutely essential. If I can use the analogy of climate change here for a moment, just as we know that as you warm the planet, you make extreme events both more frequent and more intense, but on the positive side, if we can shift the political climate of this issue, we will win more frequently and it will go farther and it will last longer than ever before. So the work you're doing back home in each congressional district with your friends, your family members, your neighbors, and yes, your elected officials is absolutely critical. Okay. So first of all, I just want to say congratulations on filling this room and like the Congresswoman just said, I look forward to, in a few years, being able to see this just expand to a football stadium. <laughs> so let me just quickly here begin. So I'm going to talk about climate change in the American mind. Uh, as Mark just alluded to, we've done lots of studies around the world, and if we want to, in a question and answer, I'm happy to talk about those as well. Uh, but for now, I'm going to really talk about well, let me just say one other thing. I know that tomorrow you guys are going to go on that hill and you're going to rock the hill. Okay? <laughs> Absolutely make a, a big difference. But what I want to talk about is what happens after tomorrow. And in fact, what happened before today is the work that you're doing back home in your districts. Because this is also critical. Yes, it's important to directly engage your elected officials, but it's also crucial to change the in the political environment in which they operate. Can you change the discourse, the conversation, the public pressure back home? And so hopefully some of the things I'm going to talk about today will help you in your efforts to do that. So let me begin by just quickly saying that it would be wonderful, it would be fantastic if we could, can, if we could hold uh, and give all Americans the equivalent of a climate change 101 class. I'm a university professor, of course I'd like people to have a full semester course. <laughs> but think about that, three months dedicated to really understanding, here's how the climate system works, here's what the causes are, here's what the consequences are, here's what the solutions are. But that's never going to happen. Never. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't, in fact, millions of Americans who want to know the details, that are asking the questions. And as a community, I believe it's our job to go more than halfway to meet them where they are and answer as many of their questions as we can. But that's not most people. Most people are too busy. They've got too much going on in their lives. They don't have the background. They don't have the training. They've got limited shelf space in their heads dedicated to the issue of climate change. So the real question is, 
given that there's limited space, what are the most important things that people know? Is it important that they really understand how carbon cycles through the global environment? Probably not. Is it critical that they understand exactly how many parts per million of carbon dioxide there are in the atmosphere at any given moment? Probably not. Okay. Now, in the course of our research and our colleagues around the country, we believe we've identified five key ideas that we think everybody, at least, should know. Okay. Five key ideas. And moreover, we boiled those five key ideas down to just 11 words. So here we go. The big five facts. Scientists agree. It's real. It's us. It's bad. But there's hope. Now, this issue is complicated, really complicated. It's global. It's incredibly complex science and so on. But in the end, this is as basic and simple as it gets. But these are deceptively simple concepts. Okay? Each of these are what I would call meta-ideas. Because, in fact, there are dozens of ways that we know, oops, that we know that scientists agree. There are dozens of ways that we know that it is, in fact, happening. There are dozens of ways that we know that it's us. It's not volcanoes. It's not earthquakes. It's not cosmic rays or any of the other things that you often hear. There are thousands of ways that it's bad now and going to be much worse in the future if we continue on the current path. And then last but not least, that there's hope. For far too long, as a community, we have tended to communicate the problem and not enough about the solutions. And it's absolutely critical that people have a sense of what we call in academic terms efficacy, an understanding that there are things that can be done, that you have the capability of doing those things, and that if you do them, it will make a difference. Absolutely crucial. If you're told that you have terminal cancer and there's nothing we can do for you, most people just go, oh. Okay? Exactly the opposite reaction of what you want. You want people to fight. You want people to say, I'm going to stand up and try to change the system and save the planet for myself, my kids, my grandkids, and all other living creatures on Earth. There's hope. Okay? So, how are we doing in this country right now on these basic ideas? Okay, so I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw from a whole series of national scale studies that we've conducted over the years. Uh, and so these are all uh, representative surveys. Uh, let's go. Okay, so is it happening? So what you're looking at here is data that we've collected over a decade, just about. Uh, and back in 2008, we hit a high water mark in this country where 71% of Americans said, yes, global warming is happening. It then dropped 14 percentage points, bottoming out in 2010. Since then, it's been kind of bubbling right around 63%, but just in the past couple of years, it started to increase, and we're back basically to an all-time record back here at 70%. So not bad, not as good as many other countries around the world, I'll say, but not bad. A clear majority of Americans at least accept that the problem exists. But what's really interesting is what ha is happening below those numbers. So here I'm showing you those same numbers, now limited to uh, registered voters, um, and broken out by political party and ideology. Because yes, I totally agree with the Congresswoman, we need to stop talking about partisanship and this climate change doesn't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It does not care, right? Superstorm Sandy did not destroy the homes of Democrats and not Republicans. <laughs> a drought doesn't destroy the livelihood of just liberal ranchers and not conservative ranchers, okay? So yes, we do have to stop thinking about it that way exclusively, but nonetheless, this is the political system we operate in. And what's so interesting in the past few years that back increase to record levels of accepting the problem is that that, is not, that change has not happened among Democrats. That change has not happened really among independents. The shift has been happening among Republicans. And in particular, among conservative Republicans who have increased their acceptance of climate change 18 percentage points in just the past few years. That's a pretty remarkable shift, 
Now, I will point out that that's only 46%, so there's a, clearly a long way to go. But this is certainly a positive sign because as they say about addiction, one of the first rules of recovery is admitting that you have a problem. <laughs> okay, so some good news on the happening front. How are we doing on the human causation? Not so good. Only about 55% as of last fall, and by the way, all this data was collected after the election. 55% of Americans say that it is human cause. And that's important, because if you don't understand that it's predominantly human cause, then many people just say, well, then we can't do anything about it. It's natural. It's just variability, natural cycles. They don't understand how that then connects to carbon dioxide or pollution, or let alone why we would take uh, policy options like, say, putting a price on carbon. Why would you do that? So this is a critical indicator that still needs work. Also importantly, Americans continue to be very, very confused about the nature of the scientific consensus about this problem. Multiple studies using completely different approaches have all converged on the basic same answer that about 97% of climate scientists are convinced, based upon the evidence, that human-caused global warming is real. There is plenty of scientific uh, controversy over, say, subsequent impacts. What will the state of drought be in sub-Saharan Africa in the 2050s and 2060s? About that, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of debate. But about the fundamentals that climate change is real and human-caused, there is literally no debate. And yet, most Americans don't understand that. Only 15% correctly understand that it's more than 90% of scientists who accept that. Okay. Now there's multiple, re well, and one other thing, this is an important belief, because it turns out that the more people understand that the scientists agree about this, the more them, they themselves say, well, then I think it's real, and I think it's human cause, and I'm worried about it, and in turn are more likely to be supportive of policy action and even individual action. And that makes perfect sense, of course, because most people are not experts on this. They're, we look to experts to guide us through the ever more complicated landscape of risks that we face today. And so many people are essentially taking a wait and see attitude. They're saying, you know, scientists, go off in a room somewhere, you'll haggle it out. If it's a real problem, you'll come tell us, right? <laughs> not realizing, of course, that scientists did that decades ago. So why is that number so low? Three quick reasons. One, scientists aren't very good communicators. I mean, we really are pretty lousy communicators in most cases. Um, secondly, the news media. The news media is how most Americans come to understand this. They don't know climate scientists directly. They're not talking over the backyard fence. And I always have to, I'm <clears throat> sorry to break it to my scientist friends, but they're not reading your peer-reviewed articles. Um, <laughs> They're not reading the IPCC reports. In fact, only 14% of Americans in our surveys say they've ever heard of the IPCC. And I think many of them are lying. Okay. I mean, a study was once done asking Americans to name a living scientist, and most people couldn't do it. And the other most popular answers were Charles Darwin and Albert Einstein. If only they were still alive. So they're not getting it from science. Most of us are getting this through the news media. Okay, now, we're not in a room with any windows, but if there were windows here, we could look outside this very moment, and there's CO2 pouring out of tailpipes. It's pouring out of buildings. It's pouring out of smokestacks. In fact, there's CO2 pouring out of your mouth and nose this very second. <laughs> but until I said it, you weren't conscious of it. It's invisible, okay? And that's the problem with this issue, is that the causes are fundamentally invisible. And likewise, the impacts are mostly invisible to people unless you know where to look. So when the media doesn't report this issue, it's literally out of sight and out of mind for most people. So I would, to come back to uh, your, your day jobs when you go back home, this is absolutely critical is that you engage your local communities and help them understand that this is a serious issue. Okay? And the media is one of the best ways to get that out at scale. The last thing I need to say here, of course, is that that number is not an accident because 
uh, it has also been the core strategy of a very large, well-funded, very sophisticated disinformation campaign run over many decades by especially the fossil fuel industry, they, who borrowed and in fact completely adopted root and branch uh, a specific strategy used by the tobacco companies. Okay? The tobacco companies understood that if they didn't have to convince Americans that smoking was good for you, they just needed to convince Americans that there was still debate whether smoking was bad. And based on that uncertainty, they knew that people would continue to smoke. And they literally raked in billions of dollars over the years uh, with that argument. That exact same argument, including some of the exact same scientists who were denying that smoking is bad for you, are the same people who are now arguing that, sci that global warming is not real, or it's not human caused, or it's not a problem. And some of them even say, you know what, it'll be good for us. So this number is not an accident, but an important one. The other thing to say is that most Americans aren't that worried about this issue. Now, we do see record levels of worry, so uh, combining the very worried and somewhat worried, we're up to 61%, but only 19% of Americans say that they're very worried about this issue. So why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the most important is something that we've learned repeatedly over the years. And that is, for many Americans, climate change is a distant problem. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more. And distant in space, this is about polar bears, or maybe some developing countries. But not the United States. Not my state. Not my city. Not my friends, not my family. Not any of the people and places I care about. And so as a result, it's psychologically distant. It's one of those issues that's out there. Maybe I wish somebody would do something about it, but I don't see why it's a priority. And of course, you've all seen these numbers over the years, is that whenever people are asked, what are the national priorities, uh, consistently climate change shows up near the bottom of that list. Okay? And that helps explain why politicians don't act, because they don't feel like they have to. Okay? This is about political muscle. And as of yet, most politicians aren't yet afraid of the climate movement. Or on the flip side, see that the climate movement and climate action and climate leadership is more likely to get them elected. And that, I think, is one of the fundamental things that this organization and others are beginning to shift. Okay. One of the other things that we learned very early is that Americans don't have a single viewpoint about climate change or frankly, any other important issue. And so people often then divide the American public into, okay, you got believers and you got deniers. Well, that's way too simplistic as well. So in our work, we've identified what we call global warming six Americas, six different groups within the United States that each respond to this issue in a very different way. And one of the first and most important rules of effective communication is know thy audience. Who are they? Where are they starting from? What are their underlying values? Who do they trust? Where do they get their information? And then and only then can you really be effective at trying to engage them. I say it sometimes it's like, it's like trying to play darts in a crowded bar with the lights off and a blindfold on. Okay? <laughs> you might hit the target sometimes by luck, okay? but most times you're going to miss. And too often you're going to hit somebody and they're going to come after you. So it's really important to think about who are you trying to engage and what is the most effective way that's going to engage them. Not what convinced you, but what's going to convince them. So here are the six. And this is as of just last November. Um, the first group is a group we call the alarmed. 18% of the American people, they're firmly convinced it's happening, it's human caused, it's serious, it's urgent. They strongly support policy action. Um, but Many of them feel relatively isolated and alone. They say, I feel this strongly about this issue. I'm really worried about it. And some of my friends and family are also as worried about it. But they have no idea, they have no sense that this is 40 million people. This little room right here represents 40 million people. That's an incredibly powerful potential issue public. Okay, again, sorry, political science term. 
that refers to that core of citizens who are so concerned about an issue that they demand systems change. And you know issue publics. It's the pro or anti-immigration movement, the pro-choice or anti-abortion movement, the pro or anti-gun control movement. Think of the NRA. That is a powerful, that is a powerful organization with real political muscle, and yet they've only got a few million members. That's what this community still lacks, but what CCL and its brothers and sisters are beginning to build fast. Okay, the next group is a group we call the concerned. Uh, these are people who think it's happening, human caused, serious, but again, they tend to think of it as distant in time and space. So they do support action, but they don't see it as a really high priority because again, they don't really see it as, uh, as urgent. Then comes a group we call the cautious. Uh, these are people still on the fence. Is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it a serious problem or is it kind of overblown? They're paying attention, but they haven't really made up their minds yet. Then comes a small but very important group that we call the disengaged. These are people who say, you know what? I think I once heard somebody talking about global warming, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know what the solutions are. Um, so basic awareness is what's really uh, the key barrier they face. Then a group that we call the doubtful. Uh, these are people who say, eh, I don't think it's real. But if it is, it's natural. Nothing we have anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about. So they say, I don't think about it that much. I certainly don't see it as much of a risk. And then last but not least are those that we call the dismissive, 9%. These are people who are firmly convinced it's not happening, it's not human caused, it's not a serious problem. And in fact, many of them literally tell us that they're conspiracy theorists. They say it's a hoax, it's scientists making up data, it's a UN plot to take away American sovereignty, it's a get-rich scheme by Al Gore and his friends, and many, many other such narratives. Okay? Now, importantly, they're only 9%. They're only 9%, but they're a really loud 9%. They're a really vocal 9%. They're a 9% that's pretty well represented in the halls of Congress. Okay. That's the power of speaking up. And they have tended to dominate the public square to the point where they've intimidated many people from even talking about climate change. It has now become a verboten topic at the Thanksgiving Day table. We don't talk about sex, religion, politics, or climate change because nobody wants to piss off Uncle Bob. Okay. If you don't talk about it, it's not important. Our colleagues have done studies, for instance, on, and you've all seen this, newspaper articles online about climate change. You read the article, then you look at the comments. Half or more of the comments are often from people in the dismissive category. It's really easy as a member of the public, as a journalist, or as a policymaker, to come away with the false impression that it's half or more of the country. But it's not. They're only 9%. We let them dominate the public square to our peril. Okay, so there are the six different groups. And now just to make the point that there are completely different conversations going on in this country all at the same time. We've actually asked Americans, if you could ask an expert one question about global warming, what would you ask? So the doubtful and dismissive down here, they're asking, so how do you know that global warming is real or human caused? And on a deeper level, they're asking, and why should I trust you? The middle groups are saying, okay, maybe it's real, but so what? Why should I care? What's a polar bear ever done for me? Whereas the alarmed and concerned are saying, okay, I got it. It's happening. It's human cause. It's serious. But what do we do? What do we do? And the fact is, again, because we have generally communicate, tried to communicate the problem and not the solutions, many of them don't know. They don't know what they can do as individuals. They don't know what we can do as neighborhoods. They don't know what we can do as communities, as cities, as states, as the nation or the world. 
And again, if you don't understand that there are things that you can do, most people then say, okay, I got other, lots of other things I need to pay attention to. Let me pay attention to the things that I can actually do something about. So it's critical that we exp explain uh, solutions. Okay. Now, one of the other things that I think is really interesting here, and this comes straight to the heart of CCL, is that we've asked people, how willing or unwilling would you be to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action to reduce global warming? Does that sound like anybody's mission statement? <laughs> and what we find is that, not surprisingly, overwhelmingly, the alarmed are willing to do this. And even a number of the concerned say they're likely to do this. But really, it's the alarmed where you're going to find the most of your people. I'm guessing probably at least 97% of you are in that category. <laughs> okay. And the fact is, when you just take the people who are already participating in a campaign, or definitely would, that's 21 million people. The NRA, by contrast, is maybe four. But they're not organized. And that's the critical difference. This group is not yet organized, which is why what CCL is doing is so absolutely vital to the future of this issue and, frankly, the planet. Get organized. And in fact, if you include the people who say that they probably would do it, that's up to 57 million people. If, you know what, 21 million, let's just focus on that. 21 million, you don't need 21 million. If you had 10 million, in fact, let's be conservative and say even half of those would do it. If you had 5 million, you would change America. Okay? But the difference is organization. Okay. So why don't people get engaged in contacting elected officials? So this is data that we have not yet made public. We just collected this in our latest national survey, which we'll be releasing in just a few weeks. And here are the barriers. Why people say that they don't do this particular critical function of democracy. And the number one overwhelming reason is that nobody's ever asked me to. It's that stupid, people. <laughs> Ask. Just ask. But also importantly, people often will say, but I'm not an activist, which raises the question of what image comes to mind when they hear the word activist, okay? They're not looking at people like you. They have an image probably of some guy with long hair, you know, hugging trees, wearing, you know, waffle stomping boots. You know, banging on a djembe, some of my best friends, actually. But <laughs> you laugh. You laugh. I got a degree in University of Oregon in Eugene. Don't, don't kid yourself. Um, okay? But that's not most people. And this is really, really important. I think it's actually one of the great advantages of this issue compared to most other issues. Because this issue has got a lot of problems with it. I call it the policy problem from hell. You almost couldn't design a worse fit for our psychology or our institutions' decision making. But what it has going for it is that it's so fundamental. This is about the climate system. It's about the very life support systems on which everything depends. Every single human being has a direct stake in this. Okay, you can't say that about most issues. This issue is absolutely fundamental. And what that means is what we're beginning to see is that it's not just the scientists speaking. It's not just environmentalists. And it's not just liberal politicians. This is an issue that we need the voices and are beginning to hear the voices of every type of person in this country and around the world speaking up. As Mark said before, and as the Congresswoman said before, Okay? We have doctors and nurses talking about climate change. We have faith leaders now talking about climate change. We have military leaders talking about climate change. We have businesses from small to enormous beginning to talk about climate change, and so on and so forth. Okay? 
when people hear the word activist, they need to see you. <laughs> their friends, their neighbors, their family members who look like them, who dress like them, who share their values and say, yes, this is my issue. Okay. Wouldn't make a difference. Also critical that you give people a sense that this is solvable. We can do this. Okay? And CCL itself and the amazing growth and success it's had is an example of that. The momentum, the energy, the excitement in this room is literally palpable. Okay? This is not a group of people who are all kind of in a defensive crouch going, oh. Trump pulled out of the Paris Accords, we're going to go home. <laughs> and yet, what's wonderful, you guys are warriors. Okay. No face paint, at least not yet, but, but, but warriors. Okay. But happy warriors. So what I think I've always loved about CCL is that I, I say one of the key things about this organization is that you're relentlessly polite. <laughs> you're welcome, sir. For those of you who didn't hear that, there was a thank you shouted over there. Amen. All right. I don't know who to contact, and I wouldn't know what to say. Well, that's exactly what you guys do. Okay? That's exactly what you do. It's why the training that you do is so important. Because it does tell you, here's who you go talk to, and here's what you're going to say. Okay? So you can solve this problem. You absolutely have it within your power back home in your districts to solve this problem. Okay. One of the things that we've tr also tried to develop is tools to help you understand the nature and the state of public opinion and engagement back where you live. And that's the Yale Climate Opinion Maps, and I'd encourage you to come visit. These are online interactive tools. Uh, Bessie Schwartz, who's here, will be leading some, uh, some workshops on this later today, uh, and I think maybe this a bit yesterday as well. Uh, so here's what the numbers that we usually give, right? National numbers. 58% uh, of Americans are worried about climate change. And that's fine and that's useful. People say thank you, that's, that's actually you know, useful information for me. But I'm working in Wichita, Kansas. What can you tell me about Wichita? So for a long time, we couldn't tell you anything about Wichita because we've never done a survey there. But we've built a, a tool, a model, that allows us to estimate the state of public beliefs and attitudes in every single congressional district, every single uh, city, every single county in America. And what you see here is that same number, worry, but now at the county level. And what you see is that there's, in fact, tremendous variation across the country, including, and I get more out of these maps every time I look at them, but you see uh, things happening in places you would never expect. Look at Texas, okay? Texas. Okay? A place that you would usually think of as arch-conservative, you know, led by former climate-denying governor Rick Perry, now our Secretary of, Se of Energy. Oops. Um, <laughs> but when you, look, when you look inside Texas, you actually see that there's a lot more going on than you might have expected, okay? That, in fact, these counties right here are as worried about climate change as counties in California. So what is that? That's Latinos. And we were the first to identify years ago. Absolutely. Contrary to the common wisdom that climate change is an issue that only upper middle class, white, well-educated, latte sipping liberals care about, <laughs> the group that cares the most about climate change in this country are Latinos. They're more convinced it's real, that it's human cause, that it's a serious problem, and more supportive of policy action. But they're the least engaged in demanding political action. So I implore you, as an organization, this is one of the many other minority groups in this country that I, 
that you have to engage, that you have to empower, and you have to get their voices into the conversation. And then back to the point back home of how often do we talk about this. Here's the estimate for adults who discuss global warming at least occasionally. Nationally, it's only 33%. Okay? The darker blue, the less likely they are to talk about it. And likewise, how often do they hear about it in the media at least once a week? Only 24% of Americans say they hear about it that often. This is the context in which you're trying to do your work. And until you change that environment, that climate of opinion back home, you're fighting against the wind. You want the wind at your back. OK, and just one example of how we've tried to do this in our own small way, but uh, I'm offering this as a model of things that you can do, and actually you're more than welcome to use this as a resource to help change that conversation. But based on our research, we decided to create our own news source. Why wait for the New York Times or the Topeka Press to do this? Can we give voice to this issue? So what we did is we created a uh, national radio program called Yale Climate Connections. It now, thank you. Um, these are 90-second stories. So not a half-hour program that only plays on Saturday night at 10 o'clock that no one listens to, but 90-second stories, a brand new one every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And the emphasis here is that second word, connections. How do we take this abstract, global, scientific problem that seems so distant and connect it to our daily lives and to our daily values? And how do we feature the voices of everyday folks who are actually engaging this issue where they live. Okay? Because those are the stories that I think we all need to hear. And I will say, as someone who's been doing this work for 27 years now, I had no idea of the amazing and inspirational work that's being done all over this country, in every sector of society. Okay? It's not just Elon Musk and Tesla and what presidents and prime ministers do. This is what everyday folks are doing because they are so concerned about this issue, they want to know, what can I do? How can I roll up my sleeves and actually uh, be the change that we all want? So I'm just going to give you two quick examples here. Uh, by the way, this is just an example of the front page of the website. You can see a map of where the stations are. We're now up to 346 uh, broadcasting this every day. Um, but we need more. OK, so let's go ahead and play the first one now just quickly. This is, you're going to hear Marianne Hitt, who came, I believe, and spoke here not too long ago. Um, but this is her story uh, that hopefully we can play. I'm Dr. Anthony Lizowitz, and this is Climate Connections. Growing up in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Marianne Hitt was surrounded by the lush, smoky mountains. So she was upset when she learned that local mining companies were blowing the tops off mountains to mine coal. It was not only devastating to one of the most beautiful places in the world, which I love very much, but devastating to all the people living around these sites who are friends and uh, beloved folks in my life. Hit became an advocate for clean energy, and having a daughter made her even more committed. In just my lifetime, over 500 mountains in Appalachia have been blown up and wiped off the map forever. She should be able to explore those mountains just as all the generations of kids did before her, and she can't. Today, Hid is director of the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. She says climate change has made her work even more urgent. In the same way that mountaintop removal is a permanent theft of something that should be my daughter's birthright, I feel the same way about climate change, that we're on the brink of destroying something we can't put back together again, and so I'm very motivated not just to fight the good fight for clean energy, but to win that fight because there's just so much at stake. Climate okay. Connections is produced by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication. Learn more at YaleClimateConnections.org. And now by contrast, let's just play the one other one to give you a, a different take entirely. I'm Dr. Anthony Lizowitz, and this is Climate Connections. As a young West Point graduate,
Kevin Johnson was deployed to Iraq in 2004. He was stationed in Baiji, home to Iraq's largest oil refinery. Insurgents attack pipelines there on a regular basis. As we were serving our mission, it was constantly in the shadow of these burning oil fires. It was hard not to see a correlation between the oil economy of Iraq and the Middle East and our presence in the region. The experience convinced Johnson that U.S. dependence on oil puts both soldiers and the economy at risk. So when he returned from active duty, he started fighting for clean energy. For the past decade, the former Army captain has worked to promote renewable energy. Two years ago, he co-founded a company called Clean Capital, which helps individuals invest in clean energy projects. His partners are also veterans. He says that returning soldiers often look for ways to keep serving their country and communities. Many of them are finding their mission in clean energy. 10% of our workforce in solar, and very similar in wind, are veterans that are working day in, day out to grow this sector of the economy. And we're very proud of it and very committed to it. Okay, thank you. Climate Connections is produced by the... And those are just six of literally 600 plus stories that we've done so far in just the past three years. And they're coming at us. And I would just encourage each and every one of you, when you know or hear of those kinds of stories happening where you live, tell us. Let us know. Because if we can, we will put them on air and share them with the national audience. And likewise, to the extent that we can help you change that conversation, if your local radio station isn't carrying this, just ask. Just say, hey, here's a great story I heard. Uh, would you consider playing this, okay? But the broader point here is that we need to change the conversation about climate change where we live, back home, because that is also a huge influence on our elected officials. Elected officials don't just simply respond to the person that's standing right in front of them saying, I want you to act. They're paying very close attention to what's going on in the conversation, especially in the media, back home. And you can affect that too. Okay, so just to conclude here, uh, it's really, for all the complexities, it's quite simple. Okay? That scientists agree it's real, it's us, it's bad, but thanks to the work of all of you and the thousands more like you back home, there's hope. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>